So the, the, the main purpose of the talk is, is Catalyst, and we're talking about building functional programs. And when we say building, we, we really mean SBT. We, we have to test things. Uh, bananas, uh, banana RDF, um, that's what uh, this came from. That's, the, that's really the history of, of how this all came about. And I think in the, the, uh, the uh, overview of the talk, it was about the, what's the future? Why, why don't these things work as well as we'd like them to work? And at the end of the day, it all comes back to um, distributed systems versus centralized systems. And really, that's what RDF's all about, is, is distributed systems, and how do we bring things together. So um, with that in mind, I think we'll just crack on. So to start with, where did this come from from a business viewpoint? So we, we can talk a lot about the maths behind things, the computer science, but this all came about from a business viewpoint, uh, which is what we do when we go to work. We want to use it to, to achieve something. Um, so my background, uh, initially physics, uh, many years I did a C++ uh, with the Boost framework and the ACE. Has anyone used the ACE framework? It's going back a few years. For a few, what's cool about it? it it's all to do with uh, concurrent programming, distributed programming in C++, and at the heart, all objects have what they call a reactor, and you build reactive systems. Ring any bells? Yeah? <laughs> okay. I'm not saying that's where it started from, but a lot of these things have been around for a while. Uh, all in banking, distributed messaging uh, frameworks, again, the messaging. It's all about communicating with different systems. Template metaprogramming, well, that's, that's more the Scala. That's why Scala's fun. You get all the fun of C++, but it's a lot easier. <laughs> <laughs> and you can actually do something. So that, that's really a, uh, my background. So what changed? What happened? Well, the credit crunch and enterprise Java. I'm not sure what's worse. <laughs> <laughs> but, but it certainly killed off a lot of projects. And it was a, certainly a good excuse to say, well, let, let's not do too much more this way. Let, let's change it. So um, what did I do? Um, I moved more into data projects, because data projects were still in fashion. Because like someone said to me, data, we've always got data problems. So there'll always be work. So credit crunch doesn't matter. There's still a bunch of work with data integration. Um, from there, I spent some time on real estate with data integration projects. And again, exactly the same problems. It just doesn't work. Now. One of the most important things here, really, for the whole talk, when, when we talk about financial data, we're talking about Bloomberg. We're talking about huge banks. Really, we're talking client server, big brother, call it what you want. If you look at the real estate market, there's thousands of estate agents, it's very distributed. So although they're, they're both concerned with finance and money, one's really big brother client server, the other's distributed. So whilst they're both not working, they're both not working for actually quite different reasons. But there's something in common. And at the end, I thought, surely someone must have looked into this. I don't want to reinvent the wheel here. Someone else, a computer scientist, someone must have thought, hold on, there's a better way. Now, I'll just give you, next slide's one of my favorites. Two-bedroom house for 13 million Swiss francs. That's $13 million. Okay, that doesn't look like a two-bedroom house to me. <laughs> okay, now, where, where did I get this from? Is it a classic? I got this on Sunday. I went to the internet and spent five minutes to find that. Okay, it's an ongoing problem. And other sites will look at this and look at, are there any inflation trends? <laughs> okay, so we can look at, oh, they've made a mistake, but it does move on to other things, okay? Just one interesting point, we have a two-bedroom house. Just one, a small point here, that's the same as saying that I have a house that has two bedrooms. Okay, this is the hour of the RDF will come in. So although we say a two-bedroom house, it's the same as saying the opposite, okay? Uh, what else does a house have? Well. It has a bathroom. So how do we describe a bathroom? Okay. A bathroom 
is used to mean any room containing a toilet. OK? <laughs> How does that work? Well, if you live in America, then you know the answer. That's, that's what the Americans say. But what the issue is, it, it's such a simple word, a bathroom. OK, it's such an easy word. And yet, it's quite easy to get it wrong. So how can they make this better? Well, you could have a full bathroom that has a bathtub, a shower, a toilet, and a sink. Or you could have half a bathroom that's a <laughs> toilet and a sink. <laughs> or a three quarters <laughs> that has a toilet, sink, and a shower. Now, if you want a toilet, sink, and a bath, I mean, I don't know what you're going to do. So how, how do we represent this? Well, here's the old way. Two and a half baths is two full baths and half a bath. <laughs> OK? But the new way is 2.1 is two full baths and half a bath, or 3.2. Okay? But if you wanted, maybe we could add something. OK? And they have two baths, 11 half baths, and eight something else, and you'd have a 2.11.8. Ooh. Does that ring any bells? Latest version of Scala. So I think this is going back to the talk from earlier. We're trying to get some big concepts and push it into something where it doesn't belong. But there are some good points here. Here we're actually getting some known things. We know what a bathtub is. So we don't have to argue about that. These texts here, well, they're just texts, really. We don't really care. And the fact that it's a bathroom, it's not a bathroom. It's a Wikipedia bathroom. So we're going from, like, it's not actually that good, to say, well, if we can express these known terms that we're happy about, then it doesn't really matter what a wiki bathroom is. What's important is that we can communicate this knowledge between people and people can use their own vocabulary. And whether it's an American vocabulary or your vocabulary, we can do it in a, in a way that's not centralized. It's not like Maven, where you have to do it this way. It's not like you can do what you want. We can just find some little things, and then we can hook things up together. And that's what we mean by a, it's decentralized, but there's some common issues to bring it together. So that's for the, the business. From the technology, RDF, that's a framework for expressing ideas about objects and abstract concepts. OK? That's what RDF is all about. OWL is based on RDF, but it's more about describing things and relationship between things. So it's more describing types. But it's describing types where we can actually pass this over the internet to different systems. So it's not a C++ type or a Java type, but it's a way of, of getting that typed information over to other people. OK, Banana RDF mentioned earlier. That's a Scala library that is based on uh, RDF and Sparkle. It also abstracts the underlying system. So whether you're using Gina or Sesame, it will, it will abstract that so you can just use what you want. Shapes. That's a new technology, and that's for describing the, the shape of the graph. And shackle is a, is a constraint la uh, excuse me, language. So what's important here is that OWL, it doesn't give you a constraint. It's not saying how your data must look. It's saying this is a description of it, and you can add to it later. Okay? It's not like XML or XSD. It's an open system, and that's, that's quite a critical difference. And of course, Scala. <laughs> so RDF, we'll go to a bit more detail here. It's an abstract syntax. It's not a file format. It's just a way of describing things. So it's not XML or XML. It's just a, an abstract way. Then you can actually store it how you want. Um, it's represented using a labeled directed multigraph, but it's not a graphing system. It's not a graph database system. They've just used that because it's the best way of doing it. Uh, models, everything in RDF is 
subject, verb, object. Technically, it's actually subject, predicate, object. And here's an example. We can say, John has age 51. Simple. John has wife, Mary. Now, you see we say has age. That's because we can reverse it and say 51, age of John. Okay, so all these properties can be reversed. Mary, Mary wife of John. So that, that's just a little convention that is a useful way of uh, getting the, the inverses. Concrete formats, we do actually want to store that. JSON LD, if you like JSON, still use it. Okay, you don't have to give it up. Okay, and a JSON LD file is a valid JSON file. You don't have to give up JSON. If you like XML, you don't have to give it up. You want a data store, RDFA, that's for marking up an actual web page. So if you're a web designer, you can use this. And that's the important thing, is that it's not a file format. Whatever formats you actually use, you can just carry on using. OK? Al. It's a language for expressing ontologies. So what's an ontology? Well, they've got a rich history well before computer science. That's another way of saying, do not talk about ontologies in front of a philosopher. Because they will go on and on for a long time. It's not really an ontology. Um, so we'll skip that. They're a vocabulary. It's just saying, look, here's some words that I use to describe things. But they can be mapped to other vocabularies. That's the most important thing. It's not your vocabulary that, that counts, or his, or hers, or anyone's. Can, can they be mapped together? Once you can do that, You've got the ideal, it's not centralised, it's not an anarchist, distributed, do what you want world. Okay? And you can express the same concepts, but in a different way, which is what we want. So this is the important RDF and L, you, it allows different schemas to evolve and change. We, we know people will add new fields. Okay? We want it to change, but we want to plan for that change, rather than just tell people off that they can't change. So what isn't it? It's not a file format. A lot of people think RDF is slow. 4.2 billion traversals in 15 milliseconds. Okay, that's not slow. That's fast. Okay? People think it's for small systems. This is my favorite. 750 million core system. That's huge. If, if you look today on what's the biggest computer in the world, it, it's smaller than that. This is the next generation biggest computer in the world. And RDF is being used on that. Okay? Tested already. Okay, ours not a programming language. It's declarative. It's like HTML. You just say what it is. And you can say what it is in any order. The order of the rules or statements don't matter. Because the idea is, you know you're going to get more rules coming in in the future. So course order can't matter. And it's not a language for syntax conformance. Because you want a system that can grow, that can be added to. So how can you restrict something that's designed to be added to if you don't know what the thing is that's going to be added to? And it's not a database framework. OK? We can use it to store data, but that's, that's another system. OK, so here's a quick examples. Woman, subclass, person. You've got subclassing. That's what you want uh, in a data definition language. Disjoint, that's a disjoint union. Man, not a woman. Okay. You've got subproperties that we've seen before. But here it's a subproperty. Has wife is a subproperty of, of has uh, spouse. And this is part of the data sharing, is providing people know what that is, you can use has wife. They've never heard of it. But providing they've got the top one, and that's, that's classic object-oriented, just classes. Um, here's an interesting one. Here we're saying the domain of has wife, man, woman. Now, a lot of people think that's like a restriction. That's saying you can only say that man has a wife. It, it can only have a value of woman. That's what you'd normally see in like XSD. But what this actually means, if you say John has wife, woman, you know 
John is a man. Just from that statement, okay, you know that Mary is a woman. It's our, it's designed to create more knowledge, and it trips people up. Okay? Um, here we have union of classes. A, a woman and a parent is a mother. Okay? And here, this is more back to what we had earlier. If we say someone has a child, then we know they're a parent. And this is more to do with the, the two-bedroom house that, that has two bedrooms. Okay? Now, here, it's, it's a logic-based language. It's, it's based on real mathematical logic. And I think there's a few little trips, trip-ups that have appeared here. So what does that mean? It means that developing ontologies is hard. That's the bad news. The good news is you don't have to develop them. You just use someone else's. It's easy. So here's a classic one, schema.org. They have a, a class created work. This is actually in, in JSON. And this is used by, by Google, Apple, Microsoft. It's a, a well-known ontology. So you can just use that. And it, it's a lot easier to use someone else's work and invent your own. And if you use this, you know it's going to map to something else. Here's another ontology. Here's from OpenPsych. Now, you can see by the address here that this is going to be slightly harder. And it is. A specialized, oh god, conceptual works, a version of conceptual works can be, uh, oh, computer program. OK? <laughs> and you can read that later. They're the same. They were done by the same people. And they've already done the mapping. So you use the easy ontology, you get the hard one totally for free. Okay? Maybe you never need to use it. Okay? But if you do want to add something slightly different that's not in the easy one, you just go to the hard one, see how they did it, and put it in. It's easy. So that's, that's it, really. Use someone else's work. I borrowed Miles' slides for this. It's, <laughs> it's, it's not a new thing. Just use someone else's. OK, so the next thing is, what, what's Catalyst? What's that all about? Um, it started with Scala.js, to be honest. Um, we wanted, or I needed to use a browser. We saw earlier there was the advert for the house. So I needed RDF. It is a, a World Wide Web uh, system. We needed it to work in the browser. That's where Scala.js came in. Um, at the time, there was no cross-platform support in Scala.js. Okay, there is now, but at the time there wasn't. Uh, the IDEs didn't support it. The only test framework was Jasmine for JavaScript, because that's a classic one in, in the JavaScript world. Scala test on the JVM. There was no common test framework. And no play support. So this is an interesting one, November 2013. In the now, that's why GitHub Monica was born. Okay, and that's actually when I started Scala programming. Okay, not too long ago. Um, interesting side point. So anyway, I did a, an SBT Scala JS Play plugin, and did a Scala test uh, Jasmine. And what we had here, I, I did uh, the uh, interface. I used Scala test because it was there and it worked. Scala test has got S Selenium built in, and Selenium can call JavaScript. So it was a quite an easy way of getting cross-compiling and type-safe cross-compilation before all the bigger frameworks came about. Okay? So it, it, it wasn't a long-term goal. It was more, look, it, it doesn't work. I've got to do something. So what did we do? Got rid of Scala Test at Banana RDF, put it with the Scala Test Jasmine. Updated the build system. Eclipse and IntelliJ just stopped working everywhere. It's just completely stopped. Okay? Now it's fine. Now it's fine. It works perfectly. But it didn't at the time. And the other thing that became obvious, if, if you want to use a Scala GS library, it's not just the library. You need all the libraries that that depends upon. Okay? That's the nature of the beast. Um, and, oh yes, Scala check was needed by Scala Z. So, SBT Scala JS was born. Test framework, build framework. 
and we have first-class cross-module support. Now it's built into uh, Scala.js, it's fine. Um, and this was actually browser and OS ag agnostic. It was a big framework, to be honest, for what it did, but it was a way of saying, okay, it's not perfect, but it, it, it does it's gonna get you working. Okay, and, and this is really where maybe catalysts came in. It might not be the final solution, but we've got a problem now, and that's quite often the case when you're using new technology. That there you go, there's the new technology, but the tools aren't there to, to support it. Okay, so how, you know, how, do you, how do you deal with that? Um, dead check. I ported Scala check to Scala JS. That was the first job. Created Z check, which was a wraparound Scala check and spec light from Scala Z, with the goal of saying, look, because that's what was holding Scala Z back. Uh, therefore, we're in a position where Scala Z could use this plugin to cross compile. We got Z check working in Banada RDF, so it didn't get in the way of Scala Z. They could just carry on working. Then Scala Z was ready to use Z check. And what happened next? The winter of discontent and Cats was born. Let's just leave it at that, yeah? So Cats was born. It didn't have Scala JS support either. Um, so then we just helped out. We said, look, we want to use this project and all its lower level projects. You're interested in category theory. We just want to use it. We'll help you out. Okay, that's, that's what a community does. Everyone, everyone wins, okay? Just a little sideline, because it pops up. Uh, Miles wanted uh, to move Shapeless onto Scala.js, but wanted to keep JUnit. JUnit didn't exist on Scala.js either. Fortunately, I'd just done Scala check. So I was aware of how Scala check worked. So basically, I've got the cross-compiling Scala check, ripped out most of the code, and had a self-contained test harness that cross-compiled. So it's a lot of work, but it's short-term, just get the job done. Like if you want to sell a product and get it into the company, all you care about is getting it in there. And if you have to build a test harness to get it in there, you build a test harness. It, it, it's that simple. Um, so this, this is totally hijacked for miles. Catalyst is basically all this work we did, helping here, helping there. Let's bring it together and just make a library out of it, okay? Maybe it's useful in the future for certain things. So we've still got many targets, JVM, JVS. Soon there'll be LLVM. That's the new one that will be on the, okay? If you want a test framework, will it support it? No. If you want it to be cross, all the cross module supports in Scala.js. If you phone up Scala.js and say, can you support LLVM? Well, I might say yes. I doubt it. So this is where this is still going to be used moving forward. And it's all about how do we help the new stuff integrate with the new without waiting a year for the tools to catch up. Um, we've also got some common test abstractions, which will be the bulk of the next few minutes. SVT Catalyst, that, that's the build infrastructure. Having done all the builds for all these different projects, what are the bits in common? We've seen earlier, what's in common? Let's pull them together and, and um, do that. A new one, this is a few weeks ago, we've got a community build actually for the Scala compiler but also it will be for the type level project. And that's part of the distributed model, okay? If you want to go away from the, let's have one big library, one big Scala lib, okay, let's get rid of that, but you need something else to replace it. And it's not just going to work on its own. We're going to have a lot of ways of doing it. And I think this is where the RDF, the OWL, is it going to be ready, or do you depend upon this? Is there a bug? That, that's where the communication and the RDF and the OWL will come in, okay? And in the future, that's what we're going for. We want it to be decentralized. We don't want one big thing. But in order to achieve that, we, we do need a little bit more than we've, than we've currently got. That's all, we just need that little bit more. more. So how are we doing for time? Um, Catalysts, it's uh, the platform, is a very small, Almost two-liner, is JVM, is JVM. If you've used Scala.js, you'll, you'll know that you've got the idea of a shared directory, you've got the idea of a JS, uh, uh, sorry, a JVM or, or JavaScript. And if you've just got one small setting, 
To have three directories as opposed to one is a real pain. So this merely says, hey, look, if you're on JVM this, L100, at compile time, it, it will go away. It will be nicely reduced um, by Scala. Be careful, though, if you've ever done C, C++, this is if def. Okay, yeah, it's, okay that's a heads up. Uh, uh, I know it's the same. You've got to be careful, but whatever. Okay. Um, right, in catalysts, this is, again, kind of similar. You've got the different frame. You've got Scala test, you've got specs too, uh, and similar. So the idea is, how, how can we write some test code that uses your preferred syntax but will run on someone else's te uh, framework. Okay? This isn't a replacement okay, for Scala test or Specs 2. Um, it's just really, it's just useful for things like CATS where you actually want to distribute the tests and go, look, I've got some tests, but please run them on your machine. Now, if we do that in, in Scala test, then we're, we're forcing not just a library, but we're, we're forcing an entire way of working on the consumer. But if we can write the test in an abstract way, and so look, if you want to use Scala test specs too, it's up to you. And because of that, it's going to be easier to get adoption. Okay? Um, it could be useful for low level bootstrapping, okay, because we've got that built in test harness. Okay, if we've got this depends upon that and that at the end you want a nice small thin hierarchy. And it could be useful if we've got our built-in test harness just to boot, bootstrap. I'm not saying you should use it for your daily work, but we've got it. It happens to be there. Why not use it? Um, occasionally, you want to minimize your dependencies, okay? But it's just, it, this is more for the lower level. But it's also useful for porting projects. If, you, if you've got a system that says is, is done in JUnit and you want to port it, normally you'd write a few little macros just to get the goddamn thing working. And, and this just, it gives it to you out of the box, that's all. Um, so the syntax provided, specs to, fun spec, uh, that's out of the box. And it will work for Scala test, specs to, and spec light, which is the internal. Okay, that's out of the box, it's just there. Um, how do we abstract it? Well, it's the same as banana RDF, in fact. <laughs> you're, you're not abstracting at the type class level, you want to abstract an entire framework. So I'm going to, before I run out of time, I'm going to zip through this quick. Uh, you have a type record. So you have one, one uh, trait with some empty types uh, that can be added later. This is all it is. We've got an assertion, assertion with a, uh, a string, triple equals, quite often that's a problem, and, and assert throw block nest gives the structure of the test. And that's really, that's at the heart of the system. That's all, all it's doing, really. A um, bit complicated because we actually want the call sign to know about this. So we have to have some macros. Macro compact that we heard earlier comes to the rescue. Um, so rather than having this, we want to have this is the thing that you implement, and that's the thing that you call that calls the actual assertion. And if you're not sure about macros, just have a look later. This isn't difficult code if you're not used to macros. It's, it, it's, you can almost read it as normal code. Okay. Um, so that's the hard work. The sugar, if you want to have F spec where you have it describe, it just calls block and nest. Okay. Um, we want matches. We want some different matches. Same pattern, define the matcher, uh, macro to call the real call. Um, so this is an example. A number when one would equal one must blah blah blah. That's quite a big structure, and, and that will run on a whole variety of different um, test harnesses just by those six abstract methods. And this is an example of the implementation. You just put the types in the Scala tests. You just actually call it, catch the exception. That's how it works for Scala test. Okay. Um, how do you use it? Well, we define a suite that extends a test suite, okay? And to actually implement the abstract tests, it's that. The actual test extends that thing there, 
with the tests you did earlier. And you just have to do that for each platform. Okay, so it's very, very easy um, to, to get this working. Same for, for spec line and, and specs. Okay. Property checks, exactly the same. Um, so you want to use Scala check. Law kit's the type record. Okay, I want to go through this very quickly. There's the type record. Here the thing, okay, that's a bit complicated, but it's the same. Here's the abstract method. Scala tests, specs two can implement it. Uh, and for check client, that's what I've added for the uh, local version. And it's the same for laws. We've got some macros. So this will expand, it will get the name and create a nice law for you. SBT catalysts, this is the build files. This is what I was saying earlier. Went through all the, the different systems. Um, and it's just getting the things together. Again, it's not an SBT replacement. Nothing wrong with SBT. It's just a little layer above, okay, uh, just to help out. All you've got to do is you add the plugin. By adding the plugin, it will bring all of these in for you. It will get all the versions for you that are currently being used. Okay? Now, someone's got to maintain that, but it's not you. <laughs> also, the libraries. It will bring in all these libraries, all the latest versions that work together. Okay? Um, in order to use this, and this is more coming back to the RDF, we want to say, look, it's for GitHub. GitHub's not part of SBT. So we just want to, like, these are the things, this is the mapping to GitHub. We'll map GitHub to Scala for, for to SBT for you. Uh, again, this is another, uh, is it Alistair Johnson or is it in the now at GitHub? Can I go to GitHub? They've got an API. Perhaps I could get the name from there. Okay? Um, and here we just say, these are the versions that I want to use. And to specify the versions, it's just a map. Okay? So they're the versions, and this is where to get it from. Okay? Because at the end of the day, uh, all you want to say is, look, I've got some module, and I want to test lib, and I, I want to use Scala test. And this is where the abstraction's coming in. The ideal thing is if we can do that in RDF4L, then all the mixing can be done outside of SBT. If you're a centralized system, you'll have someone jobs doing this, okay? Um, which is why we want to keep it outside. Maybe it's done inside of, of, of SBT as well, but we just want the option to do it differently. <coughs> and last thing, this isn't released. This expands to there using a, uh, a little, little macro. And I've run out of time, but I've finished. <laughs> I think Any we questions? Have, I think we have time for one question. So I, I think the stuff, uh, the stuff that I find really exciting is, is, is the idea of, of being able to essentially specify a, a profile of um, you know, sets of libraries, sets of plugins, sets of well, compiler versions, compiler variants, yep. and have uh, something which is um, uh, able to build a sort of a complete, consistent world of everything. Yes. Um, that, that, that's Crucible, I think, is that right? Yes, that, that will be Crucible. It, it started off as just catalyst, everything. Uh, but it was Dale that said, look, you're doing a lot of things here. Please split it up into little things. Uh, maybe." someone else wants to use it. So that, that will be the idea. So a lot of the stuff with the OWL and the RDF, it, it's where it sort of came from originally, then it moved into let's do some other bit. That, that's where I think the, the, the long-term future is because everyone will say, well, I'm using this and he's using that and that won't work because he's got a bug in the new version which you don't know about. So basically, if you can just imagine all the, the issues on GitHub relating to versions, can't we get that into a format where, if you like, SBT can read it? Not just the human that's reading GitHub. That would be the, the overriding big goal. Okay, thanks, Alistair. Thank you.